Well, I think you'll agree, all of us, that this has been a tremendous experience to see this film. Uh, I felt it's uh, a completely unique experience, and I've seen it three times, <laughs> plus this evening on the big screen. Um, and I think we've shared uh, for uh, almost two hours a very, very unique experience with a gifted filmmaker. Um, my name is Richard Hecht. I'm a professor emeritus in the Department of Religious Studies here at UCSB. Um, you've already been introduced to uh, Julia Mintz, the filmmaker, and to her left is Ava Haller, who is a producer of the film. Um, and I've been thinking about uh, the questions I'd like to ask for discussion. We'll have plenty of time for us to take some questions from you. Um, and I hope you'll stay for the whole discussion uh, so that we get the most benefit out of this extraordinary experience. So, Julia, I'd like to start with a, a, a question. And it's something of an aesthetic question, I think. And that is, for me, the film was bookended by this extraordinary aerial um, perspective at the beginning of the trees, the tops of the trees covered with snow. And you came back to that image several times in the film. Uh, and I must tell you, when I first saw that on my computer screen, I started to shiver. I felt the cold. It was so realistic. Um, and tonight, as, as I was watching it, again, I felt the cold. And it, it, the cold was there, the entire film, as a result of that first image. But then, on the other end of the, of the film, is this extraordinary uh, statement by Shalom Yoran, uh, a Belarus par uh, partisan, I believe. And if I could just read it to you, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar. And we I saw can it. say it with you, ready? OK, wait, wait, wait just a second. Wait, just, um, no, no person, person should succumb, succumb to, to brutality, brutality without, without putting, putting up resistance. resistance. Individually, Individually, it can, can save one's, one's life. life. On mass, mass, it can, it can change, change the course, course of, of history. history. So those are the two bookends of this film. And my first, <laughs> no, thank you. My my first question for our discussion here with our uh, with our uh, colleagues is, how did you weave this story from those uh, uh, trees in the dead of winter to Shalom Yaron and what individual and collective resistance can mean. How did you weave that? I mean, it was just fantastic. Thank you. It's um, a big question. I think I'd like to kind of break that down. The, the element, it was interesting, you know, as you make a film, there's always sort of certain things that you want to think about. And this film was uniquely constructed, even though it followed a linear timeline, the film was really, um, I should really end with like a storyboard <laughs> so people can see how it was crafted. It was the, the narrative arc of the film was actually thematic. And I sort of took us on the journey of the manifestation as I think of it, the manifestation of bravery and courage and the stakes of that choice. And then how one may somehow spiritually, personally, sort of handle a resolve, an ethical, moral experience, and sort of where we land. And so the film's narrative arc is actually a human story more than a history lesson. And so it was really important that the film is, is, was not intended to be a didactic unfolding where you're going to learn the story of the Holocaust in, in that way. So the timeline of the film is important just so we recognize where we are and there's some facts for you to keep you tethered to history. But because the narrative was really that of thematic intention, to begin and end within that structure was very important. And then that's kind of how we end with Shalom's quote because that's really thematically where I landed as the filmmaker, as an art activist for two decades, right? So why did I make this film? I made this film 
And we always ask ourselves that when we set out to make a film, or at least I do, why am I doing this? And so it was really the answer. And then in terms of the cold, thematically, there's some things that you always want to kind of pull out. And for me, there was a couple different big elements. One was the steel and the might of the enemy. And it wasn't just the human enemy of the Nazis and their collaborators, but it was the steel and the might of the machine. And I really tried to bring that forward in the train scene, where he wasn't just wrestling with his own moral and ethical and spiritual experience, but he was also up against the machine. The Nazis had taken control, and they were using the steel and the might of the train itself as a mechanism, and the elements. The natural elements were also a part of the film. They were the characters through which the partisans had to travel. So you've hit on some very important things. You know, could I just interrupt you just for a moment? Yeah. Because um, I, I also sort of picked out the train sequence. And of course, there are intercinematic relationships between what you've done in your film and other great films. So first I thought of, of course, uh, Shoah and Claude Lanzmann's use of, of the train. Everyone will remember that train at Treblinka going back and forth and that guy getting out and looking at the sign as the train goes back and forth. Then I thought of, of Costa Gavras's Amen and those trains going back and forth. They're going to the death camps, they're going to the concentration camps, they're going to Rome, uh, always those those trains. And so when I saw your usage of the train, especially the one that sort of bends around to the right, I was thinking, you know, the inter, if I can use this term, inter-cinematic um, relationships that you've, that mm -hmm. immediately um, are suggested, perhaps to some mm -hmm. viewers. Um, but could I ask a, a little bit more about the narrative arc, as you called it? And you assemble a completely extraordinary group of people mm -hmm. um, um, to interview. I mean, there's, there are no losers in the group. Um, <laughs> there are really people who you begin to love um, and you see their changes. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was just mesmerized. Uh, and so I want to ask a question, but let's, let's just remember um, the, the names of the seven. Um, so it started with uh, Sarah Gennati, right? Mm -hmm. And then Frank um, Bleichmann, um, and then Gertrude Boyarski, or Gertie, I think is her nickname, and then Michael Stoll. Um, he's that sort of gritty guy with the open shirt. Uh, and then there's uh, Faye Schulman, the photographer, um, or the, who has the photographic collection. Um, and then there's Isidore Farbstein and figuring out how to get away from those guys who wanted to drop his drawers. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then there's um, Hayala Poros Pilevsky, who I want to come back to later because I think she's, for me, said some very, very important things. And then Luba Abram, uh, Abramovitz. So how did you find these people? And mm -hmm. can you tell us about the relationship, the relationships between you and them as they developed, and what and what you learned about uh, each of their strengths. Well, I love that we said their names. There's actually for the film, I interviewed several dozen people, and in the credits, there's actually several of the partisans that I interviewed are also credited. And I mention that because the film is crafted very deliberately to be, um, it's, it's, the, its purpose is to represent the whole. So when Gertie tells the story of virginity and yeah, there was, there was, that wasn't just Gertie's story. That was, that was a much larger story of so many uh, women that were in the forest or when speaking about this actually earlier, when Luba is talking about her experience as a soldier, I pushed, I pulled, I couldn't take Lena with her. 
and Lena was her, you know, they, they were in the platoon together. This is a soldier's story. They had sort of crossed over from being mothers and daughters and sisters, and now they were soldiers and now veterans when I meet them. And that's really, truly their experience. So it's true. I learned from the eight that you met, but really the film is crafted to be all of their stories. And so each story that's in the film and Chaya burying her photographs in the sound, in the, in the earth. I mean, this is also a story very much of the war-torn Eastern Europe and Europe at large. I mean, people buried their belongings. They buried their cherished memories. They buried photographs, the Ringwald Library. You know, there's, there's all sorts of things that were buried in the earth, not just the physical beings and the souls of so many that were slaughtered. So I think that our history is represented in many different ways. And, um, and so what I learned were so many different things, but the partisans themselves, the one sort of a miraculous thing was not only their survival, but the other facets of what what it was, how they became partisans, what they left behind, and how each of them risked their lives to do whatever they could to stop Nazism, to stop the war. And well, Ava, you can speak to what happened to your family, to your brother, um, and his participation. Why don't you take that forward? Well, my brother was one of those in the woods, actually he was on his way with four comrades. They escaped from the labor camp, the Nazi labor camp, and they were on their way to Tito, to Yugoslavia. Tito was really the head of our partisans. He was really the one that, uh, he was the magnet, and he was probably the starter of, of, of the movement. And. Uh, they were quite close to the border when he, they were hiding in a barn some nights to, to sleep and the barn always had to have a back door and the front door for escape and they heard guns and they heard dogs and my brother turned to his four companion, four guys and said, go ahead, go ahead in the back and I will cover for you. Well, that was a very unselfish and great act of courage. He was killed there, and uh, we didn't know where it happened, and it was, we knew from the four survivors that their lives were saved by my brother. And uh, that was, we found out, but everybody was coming back, and he didn't. And so it was my mother's heroic act to get on the top of a train because it was so crowded and so difficult and took a train to that village where the other four identified the fact that they last saw him. And as she arrived to this village on the clothesline was my brother's shirt. So she came back and said, He's gone. He was 21 when he was killed. And you know, almost 70 years or so later, for me the idea to be with Julia, to honor his memory, is such an act of beauty and generosity on Julia's part that sort of gave me back my brother and his memory, and uh, and I'm grateful, and I admire it, and I know that watching the film, you all must have felt pride in humanity and in achievement, and enjoyed the film because it's so incredibly beautiful. So, I wonder if. Um, I can ask another question about um, what did these seven 
do with their experience after the end of the war? What did they do? Um, because by the conclusion, you, real, you're, you realize that you're working or you're listening to and involved in the lives of seven extraordinarily strong people. And they have different strengths, yeah, it appeared. So what did they do after the war? You know, it's so funny. When I set out to make the film, the, one of the hardest things, I'm sure you know this as a professor, right? And now I think all of us become professors every time we start researching something on the internet because you're like, oh, this is really cool. And then you're like, whoa. And then you kind of start going down another rabbit hole. Next thing you know, you've learned about 1,700 different things that evening. And you haven't yet really been able to get where you needed to go, right? And so one of the things that I knew from my very first interviews was that I had to be like those horses in Central Park. I don't know if you've all been to New York City. <laughs> you know, like I had to do this because the depth and the breadth of what the partisans had to share with me was so deeply extraordinary. And um, I really stayed away from like their contemporary lives. I do know a bit, but I chose very specifically to end the film in the way I did. And I think as the director, it, it was really important to me to allow us to really stay within who they were in this piece of our collective history. And yet I wanted to bring you full circle at the end, you know, we get these cameos where you get to see that they found their way to love and laughter and smiling and I was sitting with you and Sarah takes that picture out and she holds the little book up and she's like, yeah, that's me with the grenade, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and sitting with Faye on her couch and, you know, we're sitting and having tea and she's like, and this photograph is when I blew up that bridge and this photograph, <laughs> you know? And so it was really nice to be able to bring you all into the living room of this moment in time when the film was created and as Ava had said earlier, you know, where we got to go in and open this history, this Pandora's box, and that these people were kind enough to open their wounds for all of us, for, for all of us, beyond this room, into the world, into the future. So I will say, um, you know, somebody said, well, did the partisans make a difference, really? And I, I was drawn to that when I'm asked that question because the idea of each human being that walks on the planet, each of us, ordinary people, has the ability to make a difference. And then that goes back to Shalom's quote, to, to impact the path of another human being. And each of us in our ordinary simplicity can do things that we didn't think were possible. And so the film and their bravery like fully brought out a different kind of courage within me. And, you know, no, no one can really know. Like we don't know the Einsteins that were murdered and we don't know of all the lives that weren't lived. But what we do know is that Shalom Iran's daughter became a DA in New York City who tried most recently the first act of like first degree murder terrorism against a white supremacist neo-Nazi murdering a black person in New York City, and it was tried as terrorism and a hate crime in this country. So she's changed the course of history, and he changed the course of history. But, you know, generations can only tell us the greatest impact, and the truth is, is the partisans did impact. I mean, we know they stopped trains going to the front lines, and we know that they bought days before ghettos were liquidated. And in those days, babies were born and people escaped. So Luba brought 400 people to the forest. And so we know they did. But in terms of who they were today, I think I like to answer that question is there, there, there are eight of the 25,000 of the six million that didn't make it. And, um, 
I think that's pretty extraordinary. Um, I wonder if I could just pursue it just a bit more with you, the transformation of the seven mm. in the film. And uh, I was struck by how each of them, or not each of them, but several of the interviews confronted the problem, the ethical, moral problem mm. of killing. Yeah. And um, I was really struck, and I'm sure each and every one of us who's, who has, has seen the film will nod, and I think in agree, I hope in agreement with me, that when um, Michael Stoll is telling about killing the Germans, he says, and I'm quoting him at this point, humanity walked out from him or from the you. Humanity, it walks out of you. It walks out of you. And I was struck by that. Were you struck by that as well? And how by the end of the film, he sort of walked back into his humanity. Um, so there's a transformation. And some of these transformations are really um, quite extraordinary. Remember, um, um, Faye is ordered by her commander to kill the German with a knife. And she's supposed to, I think, return to this place shortly. And she's late and because she doesn't want to do it. And in the meantime, they've killed the German. And she says, well, you know, my watch was late or uh, running yeah. slow. And then for me, Hayala and her description of returning home. And there's nothing except there was that orchestra and the young violinist who plays the music that her father played. And she feels or sees his presence with her. And she bursts into hysteria and crying. And then at the end of that, um, she says essentially, um, she had never cried before that moment. And when she awoke the next morning, she felt like a new person that she had become something new. And then finally, with Gertie, um, when she asks how she survived, why she survived, she says, the reason I survived is to tell the story. And that just struck me as so powerful, that the transformation of these people coming to understand what they had done. I don't. I think that was beautifully said, don't you? <laughs> I do, I mean, yes. Well, I, I, I agree with everything you said. D um, when you edited it, yeah. do you sort of pull those things out to give the, give the emphasis <laughs> that I caught? I, I don't think Absolutely, I'm a... that's why I'm like, good, it worked, <laughs> you know? Um, I mean, it's, that is, that's exactly where I wanted you to go. I think that that's, that is, that's what we want, you know, we wanted to do exactly what you said there. One thing about that story with Faye, which is a bit subtle, she says, I cannot kill someone when they're tied up. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a, it's a small little sound bite, but I think that it's important because in that moment, you know, she's, she has not become a killer, she's, her and I think all the partisans, they, they didn't want to become killers. They wanted to defend their lives. They wanted to stop the Nazis. They wanted to end this bigotry and hate, which is what I want to do too. I think it's what we all want to do. We, we all want to stop this today. One of the things about in Chayela's story where she says, I cried and cried, and it was like a storm came out. I think that Again, you know, we're, we talk about something that's been buried for so long and then something can happen where an opportunity, I think for many of the partisans, I'm sort of leaping back to something you said, you know, how did I find them? You know, many people, they tell their story for the very last turn and they knew it. And so when we began our journey together, it was an opportunity to go back and perhaps come back to something that had been closed for a very long time. I think perhaps you'd like to share with them. I mean, I know that you had said 
when we first became connected, that the film, something that was, if I may. Of course. That, you know, this is something, these are very painful wounds. And in order to go on in your life, you can be so motivated to do social justice work like you have done and to repair the world. But to actually go back into that time and that space is a choice. It is, but it isn't. Because once you see it, you can't ignore it. Once you see it and the wound is opening and, and you are able to remember and to face the pain you had. And it, it's funny because very often when I had an opportunity to speak to young people and they would question me about why I do what I do and, and my answer was always, in honor of my brother John's memory. But I didn't really realize when I said that how deeply it would affect me to meet Julia and see the film as she was creating it. So my gratitude is for her to open something that needed to be opened and and told to my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren, this was your uncle, and this is what he's done. And it would have never occurred to me to want to share it with the future generations. So thank you, Julia. This reminds me of a good story. So Michael Stoll, who jumped from the train, we were sitting and he had his granddaughter here and he had his daughter here. Yeah and we did a screening for Michael in his home. And he's watching the movie and he keeps going like this. This is what it was like. This, this is what it was like. It was just like this. And then he'd go to me, how did you do that? And he's watching the movie. This is what, <laughs> he's hitting them the whole time. And then he said, you pulled it out of my head. You pulled it right out of my head. And I was so happy and he said, you pulled, it was just like that. And then the lights came up and he said, this is like Fiddler. Everybody can see this movie. <laughs> so, but you know what you've done is you created a future for those because by the time you made the film, those people you interviewed were then in the 90s. Yeah. And there's, as of a couple of months ago when we last talked about it, Julia said that one of those were still alive and very much involved in coming to see the film and supporting Julia. Yeah, it was really nice. We recently, for Holocaust Memorial, we were featured on ABC and we did a little piece and they talked about Six Million and the Holocaust and then they brought me on and they showed clips from the film. And as soon as I left the studio, I called uh, one of the partisans and, I, and they had seen it and they were so overjoyed to know that the film and this piece of history was represented on this day because as, at least for me, you know, this was very unknown. This was a piece of our collective story that had been sidelined and as many women's stories in history and women in combat and our stories are now coming further to the forefront and the partisan stories, it's, it's, really, it's really nice to have the film, you know, where we can place it within this larger telling. Um, I, had, I had a colleague at U University of Southern California. Um, she was an anthropologist. Her name was Barbara Meyerhoff. And Barbara did her first anthropological studies among the Huichol people of northern Mexico. And then she turned to a, a very famous project on uh, the elderly in Venice, California. And she once developed this idea, which she said, you know, some people define the human being as homo faber, homo erectus, whatever it is. And she said, most fundamental thing about the humans is that we are homo narons, or narrating people, storytellers. And Barbara's argument was that telling the stories is always a way of 
coming to terms with the trauma that many of us have experienced. The ability to tell the story uh, is very, very powerful. And so you as the filmmaker are the vehicle that allows them to tell the story to heal themselves and perhaps heal us as well. You think that's right? I, l that's I love good. listening to you okay, talk. <laughs> yes. <pretty> good. That, <laughs> yes. Can we quote him? You have that, right? Uh, so um, <laughs> when I was watching this on, the, uh, on my computer, um, the sound wasn't so good. Um, and of course, I loved the ending. Dance Me to the End of Love with Leonard Cohen. And I was thinking all the way through, is she going to use Leonard Cohen doing the French partisan song? And uh, I said, no, she wouldn't do that. But then, he's, then he did it at I the end with Dance me, Dance me to the <laughs> End of Love. But the, the sound was so extraordinary. The, the soundtrack Thank was you. so extraordinary, especially when I think it's I think it's Isidore who's talking about Yom Kippur. And in the background, you can hear the single cello playing um, Kol Nidre. And it sort of lifts up. It goes up to the top of the frame of the, of the camera and sort of disappears into the, the heavenly world. Um, so I thought it was just the soundtrack was, was amazing. Thank Richard, you. you are absolutely brilliant. <laughs> okay, thank you, Eva. <laughs> no, truly, you are bringing out nuances. Uh -huh. And nuances are the most important part of a film. Well, it's, this has been an extraordinary evening, and there's no better place to see a great film like you've produced than in this Pollock Theater. Beautiful. Uh, under the uh, auspices of the Carsey Wolf. Uh, center. So thank you very, very much, Julia and Ava, thank you. for sharing this extraordinary film with us this evening. And may I add our gratitude for the Chancellor and, and Dilling to be here with us tonight. You have honored us with your presence. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>